Continue on. Walk on Heaven's Road. Amen. Who's that walking down the road carrying such a heavy load? Sinners, lay your burdens down because we're walking on Heaven's Road. And when you're walking on the Heaven's Road, you got to lay down that heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me. Praise God. Glory. I'm singing all the way, I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven road? Young folks walking hand in hand, singing with the angel band. Old folks ain't so tired no more, cause they're walking on heaven's road. And when you're walking on the heaven road, you gotta lay down. Jesus said he'd walk along with me, praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way, I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven road? Ain't no tears, no crying there, ain't no sadness anywhere. Ain't got time to shed a tear, cause we're walking on heaven road. And when you're walking on heaven road, you gotta lay down by heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me, praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way, I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven road? Thank you, everyone, for bringing here this morning. Welcome to the Roanoke Valley, Valley Church. Um, we got our first good cold Sunday of winter weather, amen, in January. Maybe it might snow, we don't know yet. But uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here. Thanks for coming out, and we'll continue on with the worship, amen. You can all be seated. Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. O Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fills its lovely place, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His covenant and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. All blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lindsay, and I have the uh, joy of sharing communion with you this morning. Um, and, you know, something I've been thinking about recently is, and I think it's kind of been a buzz in our fellowship, is just a lot more discussion about the Spirit, um, which has been really encouraging. And so I wanted to share a passage that's been on my heart in relation to communion with that. Um, it's in John 14. Verse 25 to 27. All this, this is Jesus speaking at the last Passover meal that he had with his disciples before he died. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Um, I love that Jesus said, it's okay. I'm going to remind you of things <laughs> because I need a lot of reminders um, all the time. And, um, you know, something I was thinking about with this is that how there's little reminders of people when they pass away. Um, even this morning, Paula gave me a really special present um, that was one of her moms who passed away, a little cottage. Um, and it's, it's just this little piece of Miss Joyce that we get to carry with us, which is really special. Um, I think about, you know, um, uh, Natalie actually loves to find treasures, and um, she'll find the most amazing things on this gym floor. Like, <laughs> it's really amazing when she leaves church. Um, she'll have a whole little pouch of beads and crystals and things. Um, and we always kind of tell her that actually that's like a little piece of her great-grandfather in her because he was always finding treasures. Um, he would find things that people would throw away in the dumpster. Like he would just, he would find these amazing things. And he even set up a little shop outside the dumpster um, where he would give them to people he found $100 bills on sidewalks. Like, he just was a treasure hunter that, you know, grew up in the Depression and really appreciated those things. Um, so I think of that, you know, that uh, 
whenever we see Natalie kind of finding those things, we're like, oh, there, there's great granddad right there. Um, and, you know, many of us were there when our dear sister Jackie um, almost gave us sort of a final lesson at her birthday celebration. It was very powerful. Um, and I know for many of us, those words have, have come to mind as different things come up. Um, I, there's many times that I've found myself almost in, in an imaginary conversation with Jackie again. Like, what do you think about this? <laughs> Jackie, what, what do you, what would you say about this? And, um, you know, things that she said that day come to mind, just about not being petty about things, about making things right in relationships, um, just a lot of stuff she shared that I'm going to carry with me. Um, and, you know, I think the ultimate example of this is what Jesus said here, that he's going to send his presence to us. Um, to remind us of things that he has said, to prompt us when we've forgotten. Um, and often I, when I'm taking communion, I, I often take an account of why he needed to die, which I think is very, very important to stay grateful for my forgiveness, to look forward to eternal life. But also I, I've lately been really wanting to ponder this gift that he sent as well. Um, and and really think, okay, what is his spirit prompting right now? Um, I have a choice as I take that communion um, and even outside of this time to grieve the Holy Spirit, to ignore it and push it aside, um, or to stay in step with it. Um, for me, a lot of times the prompting is not just the words that he said, but how he said it. Um, I can give my kids a lot of words as they will testify. <laughs> I like to remind them about a lot of truthful things, but how am I saying it? Is it, is it full of the spirit? Is it full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, all those things? Um, and that is a, a prompting that the spirit is, is always putting on me. Um, but I love that this time of communion is a chance for us to recall that he has given this life, so we have this opportunity that in, unless he died and rose again, we would never have a chance to have God living inside of us to remind us of these things. Um, so uh, as we, you know, if you'll have a communion cup on your chair. If you don't have one, there's more in the back. And I think just take some time to, to reflect right now on the body and blood that was shed, but also the gift that he sent and what, what that gift is teaching us right now. Um, and I'll go ahead and pray. Dear Father God, Lord, uh, thank you so much that you do not leave us alone, God, that you have, that Jesus came to be so intentional about what he told us and what he did so that after he was gone, that these words would just be on for eternal life, God, showing us how you want us to be in this world, Lord. I pray that um, your spirit can even just make, make things very clear in our hearts right now, God, of anything that, um, anything you're wanting us to do, God. I pray that you will recall even just particular words to each of us during this time. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.
Amen. Now is the time that we have an opportunity to, to offer something, offer, an, offer a gift. And I love how we're studying about the building of the temple, the rebuilding of the temple, and how there's all these little details in there of this person brought this little thing and this little thing, and it seems minuscule on its own, but when it's put together, it, it creates this incredible place for God to, to, to be present among them. Um, and the image that came to my mind just of nowadays is if you've ever um, been part of receiving or giving a gift basket, um, I got this amazing gift basket for my birthday, and I just felt like I was going through one thing after another, and it was a lot of little things that people had put in there, but it turned into this, like, amazing gift that I had, and sometimes I feel like we can feel that, like, oh, what's my little candle going to do here for the church, <laughs> or what's my little notebook or box of chocolates, but when we put it together, it's it's this incredible gift that that can encourage God and so many people, so... Um, with that in mind, um, we, I'll pray for the contribution. You can give um, via Venmo, um, or we have a cash or check collection in the back as well by the communion table. Um, dear God, Lord, thank you so much just that you allow us to be part of building uh, your home, God, and that we have something valuable to offer, especially as we all Put it together towards this greater cause, God. I pray that um, that your spirit can even just put things on our heart, uh, what to give, God, whether it's financially or if it's of our time or kindness, God, anything today. I pray that, that we can just walk in step with that. We love you, Lord, and pray that you'll continue to guide the rest of the service. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, parents, you can release your kids now. Let's all stand for more song. Um, and a real announcement. Well, actually, it's a women's midweek this Wednesday. Men's, oh, it's a men's week. Men's midweek this Wednesday. Uh, we'll get the de details out to you. And we'll be meeting actually at Radford next Sunday, uh, 11 o'clock, 11, 11 a.m. next Sunday at Radford University in the Bonnie uh, for our campus service. Amen. Let's stand. We'll get started with more of our song. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, 
resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. I'll be seated. Wow. Come on, Scott. Bro. Thank you, worship leaders. Appreciate you guys so much. Cliff, Hazel, Abby, Scott. Scott's voice is rich. I miss, missed that. He was in Hampton Roads. You got to hear that. So great to have him up here uh, worshiping and helping us to worship. Amen. Welcome to the Rolling Valley Church. Uh, we are going through a series entitled Rise through the book of Ezra, the historical books the Old Testament. So I do invite you to flip over to Ezra chapter 3 this morning. We're going through a time, Lindsay mentioned it in the communion, and she did a great job. You know, no bias at all whatsoever. Um, I don't have biases, but uh, yeah, she's, she did great, and she looked great doing it. Yeah, amen. Not, not all of us can say that. Anyway, um, but we are, uh, are going through Ezra 3, as she mentioned, you know, we are in the section of text where uh, Ezra the historian here is recounting the time in which God's people had come back from exile from Babylonia and had built the foundation of the temple. And there's going to be mixed reviews uh, as we read here today, mixed reviews of that foundation. They have already built the altar. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, that uh, the importance of worship to God's people, that before they built the walls and before they did anything else, they wanted to worship God. They wanted to get on with their sacrifices. They recognized their need for God's protection God's forgiveness, and that preceded their own physical protection. And that, that's a lesson for us in regards to what our priorities are and what, what is in our heart. Are we, are we trying to build a shell around ourselves, protect ourselves, or are we going to God trusting him uh, with him, uh, what he can do and only he can do? But today, uh, we're going to read verses 7 through the end of the chapter here. And uh, these verses and the, the, the songs that Cliff and the brothers and sisters picked out for us to worship today are, are perfect. I mean, they are exactly uh, spirit-led in what we'll be talking about here in this text. But before we read verse 7 through 13, uh, please pray with me, and we'll, we'll jump in. Uh, Lord in heaven, God, thank you so much for an opportunity to come before you. Father, we know that this uh, path for us to sit before you, to sing songs to you, to have your word opened uh, before you, God, was paved uh, through so many faithful people, ultimately through your sovereignty, your goodness, and as we reflected in, in communion, uh, this opportunity to come before you with a clear conscience, uh, to, to have the confidence that you're hearing us and that you're with us, was paved uh, through your son, Jesus. And God, we now pray that in, in turn, our hearts would be soft uh, to hear what your spirit wants us to hear. God, that you put on my heart uh, things that you want me to say. And if there's things that I've prepared to say that you don't want me to say, then don't let me say those things. God, it's about your spirit and about what you're doing in the world. Help us to, at this time, individually and collectively align ourselves with it, to have ears that hear and hearts that listen, and to put it into practice. Bless our time here and uh, encourage us, strengthen us, equip us, the needs that we have before you know intensely and lovingly. Uh, please meet those needs through this time. We ask our listener's son's name. Amen. Amen. Any uh, Star Wars or Star Trek fans out there? Anybody? Okay. So I, I grew up not watching either of those things, and, you know, I thank my dad for that. Thank you, God. No, just kidding. Uh, no. I've offended people already. Boo. Okay. Get out and play. Go run around the grass. <laughs> like, anyway, <laughs> that's, that was my directive, and uh, I appreciated that. My parents are here. Uh, my dad, Rick, and my mom, Pam, are, are here today, and they were with our, our kids yesterday holding it down. And I appreciate them so much. But um, the Star Trek movies and Star Wars movies came out quite some time ago, where some of us were are growing up. But then, as I'm growing up, they're doing all the remakes. They're doing all the new Star Wars movies. And they just never stop. They just keep adding stuff. Um, and I don't know if it's new or old, but they just keep pumping them out. And there's mixed reviews when these things come out. That the ones that saw it back in the 70s, is that right? 70s when they first came out, they're like, Oh, what a sham! That's the, that does not capture blah, blah, blah. And there's all this commentary about how the, the new ones are nowhere close to the originals. And then the young people are like, oh, the CGI blew my mind. I couldn't 
I couldn't walk out of the theater. I was so overwhelmed. It was amazing. And you have this stark contrast between someone who's maybe to the right or your left at the theater who comes with the same anticipation, like, oh, this is going to be amazing. And then one person's like, what a sham. And then the other person's like, that was the best moment of my life. And you're like, how does that happen? How can there be so much anticipation and someone leaves completely disappointed and the other person's like, this sets a new path for my life as I know it. And it's like, whoa, 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 how does that happen? And I can't chalk it up to anything else other than we're just humans and we have our expectations and we have our desires and wants. And uh, I know from being married for 16 years, every single one of my disappointments or Lindsay's disappointments or any of one of our serious fights or fickle fights, which the fickle fights far outweigh the, the serious ones, every single one of those was because we had one of two things. They all boiled down to expectations. They were either communicated or not communicated. And when those expectations weren't fulfilled for one reason or the other, there was a fight or a disappointment. Uh, and sometimes in my bozo caveman head, I can walk around thinking, I'm completely fulfilled. And my wife in the same moment is like, what a sham of a husband. No, just kidding. <clears throat> it's like, whoa, I'll just chalk that up to being a bonehead and, you know, rough and tumble, manly. Anyway, anyway. So nonetheless, what we have here in Scripture is that we have folks that grew up experiencing something and now it's being remade and they look at it and they said that's not what I hoped it would be and then we have new young people that most likely uh, were, were in Babylonia they were born there they're children of the exile literally born over there under under the thumb of Nebuchadnezzar and others and now they're here back to Jerusalem for the first time and they're seeing what only their grandfathers and grandmothers and aunts and uncles have talked about now they're actually seeing it themselves and there's much rejoicing and it's a really odd text this morning of how can God's people be so exuberant and so disheveled and broken at the same time when something which seems to be great is happening and I think it gives us a little bit of a peek into the human condition and I believe it it's a bigger picture here that, that I want to hit home is that it's really not about the temple it's not about the foundation. It's really about what the temple was pointing to. And we, in hindsight, are actually able to see what they had only ho would hope for. That this temple that they built was everything. It was everything to them. And we know that the temple that was built there physically was just pointing to the real, the real fulfillment of God's presence here in the world. And Lindsay just talked about that in communion. It is the very spirit. If you're a disciple of Jesus, the very spirit inside you is where God dwells now. And they could only, that would have blown their minds to say, you know what? This temple is as great as you think it is or as disappointing as you think it is. It's not what it's about. It's actually about the fulfillment of God's promises coming where he will dwell among us. Not in a building, not behind a curtain, but right here and everywhere. So that's my hope today is that we, we recall, we learn from our, our, our past here to put our hope in the promises of God. That we put our foundation squarely on what God has done and what he will do. We're standing on the promises. We just sang that song. We stand on the promises. We talk about our uh, Christ, the solid rock I stand. That was the theme of all the worship songs is standing on Christ, standing on his promises, that our foundation is not shifting sand. It is God. And I pray that this text can bring that about one more time for us, as it seems very clear the Spirit wants to remind us this morning of what we're supposed to be leaning and standing and building on. Amen? So, Cliff, thanks, bro. Uh, amen for putting all that together. I know you're reading Ezra, so you're probably on it, but nonetheless... I'm encouraged. Let's read together verse, uh, verse 7. It says, Then they gave money to the Masons, to the Dave Youngs, and carpenters, <laughs> and gave food and drink and olive oil of the people of Sidon and Tyre, so that they would bring cedar logs by the sea from Lebanon to Joppa, as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year, after the arrival, arrival of the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, 
son of Shetiel, Joshua, son of jo- Josadak, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had returned from captivity to Jerusalem, began the work. They appointed Levites, 20 years old and older, to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers of Kemiel, and his sons, descendants of Hodaviah, and the sons of Henadad, and their sons and brothers, all the Levites, joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. So supervision and being a supervisor is a biblical role. So even if you get a headache from it, hey, doing God's work. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And we sing that song. His love endures forever. Yeah. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and old heads, oh, family heads, who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. While many many others shouted for joy, no one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. So you have this, this moment of it's time to build. And let's build the temple. Let's lay the foundation. Let's get to work. And they do, and there's supervision, and everyone, all hands on deck, everybody's in it to see this built. And when that beginning of foundation is laid in verse 10, they sing a song. They're, they're prescribed as David, no surprise there, David prescribes cymbals and tambourines and all these things to praise. Music and worship. It's biblical. So anyway, we have all this instrumentation. It's right here for us. And they sing the song we are reminded of often as we sing in our fellowship. He is good. His Lord, his, faith, his, his love towards Israel endures forever. And all this, that beautiful scene is happening. Joyous sounds. But as we read at the end there, it's, in, it's indistinguishable. Is this a happy gathering? Or is this a sad gathering? There's so much noise going on, I can't discern if this is a happy group or a sad group. Could you imagine walking in here, maybe a little late, and we're singing a song, and it's like, what is it? Are, are they excited about this? Or why, is it, why are some people crying over there? What, what is this? Are they overcome with emotion? They're so excited. You know, some happy tears. Are these happy tears or sad tears? The Bible makes it really clear that these aren't happy tears. People are discouraged. They're disappointed. That this is just, this can't shake a stick at what I remember this being. And we've all been there, haven't we? It's not just Star Trek and Star Wars or whatever, you know, the trilogy. It's, the trilogies never do well for the most part. You know, Toy Story 3, disappointing. Anyway, and it's just <laughs> moving, on, moving on. But these. This is there in their hearts, and there's a real depth of what they wanted to see, what they hoped they would see, that there's a sense of, of prophetic truths that fill both of these, these groups' hearts, that God is going to fulfill his word. The temple is going to be built. We will be back in Jerusalem where it all began. And there's that budding of anticipation. There's that exuberance of like, this is it, this is it, this is it. And then it's like, wait a minute, this is it? That, that? No, 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 no. That's not, that's not what I hoped it would be. That's not what I heard it would be. That doesn't look anything like what I thought. And hopefully you're not like, shout out to Lindsay's dad when her older brother was born. He was born 12 pounds, big guy. They, they said he looked more like Winston Churchill when he was born. <laughs> and I tell you, no lies, the first thing Lindsay's dad said to his mom, or to his wife, who just went through labor, 
who's looking at her firstborn, he goes, are you disappointed? <laughs> and in that moment, a mother, you know, exuberance, first child, oh, my baby boy. And a dad who's like, meh. <laughs> How could that happen? There's more to the story. And if Les were here to defend himself, he'd hear it. But he's not, so it's <laughs> But we have this dichotomy of response, and it's, it's real to them, and it's, it's real to us, and we've got to bring it home to 2023 to really what we can learn. But the truth is, um, some cool things happen here as they first off begin to build. And if you know your Old Testament, verses 7 through, the verse 7, only verse 7 there, it actually lists the same, same product, same, uh, same, same materials, rather, and the same places that David issued to build his temple, or Solomon eventually built that temple. So not only are they rebuilding the temple, but they're rebuilding the temple with the exact same materials from the exact same places. If you want to jot this down, 1 Kings 5 is where Solomon made the arrangements with Haram, king of Tyre. And in that, in that chapter, uh, we know Haram's servants go and take the cedars of Lebanon, to the sea. If you've ever been to Israel, there are no trees. There are no trees that we see here in the East Coast or in America or many places in the world. There are no trees. There are, there are olive trees, but you're not getting much wood from them. And they serve a much larger purpose. So they still, today, ship their lumber from these places. And it's huge. It's a huge ordeal. So they're, they're going to Lebanon. They're going further north to get their trees, and they'd see it here in 1 Kings 5. In 2 Chronicles 2, if you're taking notes, uh, they rafted those, those things from, they rafted the lumber around Lebanon, which goes, is on the coast of the Mediterranean, and they're out to the Mediterranean, and then they come to Joppa, which is a coastal town uh, in, in Israel. It's where Peter eventually will, will go, or Andrew goes, and uh, you'll see the centurion, Paul will actually be imprisoned nearby in Caesarea there. So, boom, they're coming around the, the Mediterranean coast to drop off these, these logs for the temple. And uh, in exchange, we know Solomon in 1 Kings 5 also provides food, as it says here, drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon. Solomon did the exact same thing. What's the point? We talked about this last week. The men and women of God were set on doing things the way God said. They took zero shortcuts. Zero shortcuts. They looked back to the faithfulness of their ancestors and said, okay, we have an opportunity to build something here. We're not going to put a new spin on it. We are going to do the exact same thing our fathers did. And it's not a stubbornness it's not, it's not a lack of progressive thinking. It's not like, hey, man, we do it the old way. This is the way we do it. It's not this grumpiness. It's a, it's a sense of this is God's path, and therefore we will do it that way. And I think there's a lot to be said about that because as I get older, I find myself kind of shifting camps. When I was younger, I was like, man, why has it got to be that way? Why is it? always got to be that way, their way, the way it used to be. And we, can we mix things up a little bit? And obviously I'm not talking about things that are like, you know, set, uh, set in stone, pun intended, but really thinking through like, hey man, why can't we, why can't we put a little new spin on a little Gen Z spin or whatever it might be, a little millennial twist. And, and right now, uh, right now I'm shifting to, okay, I've had that and yeah. And now I'm like, hey man, we need to we need to do it the way we always did it, man. And it, now I'm almost 40 years old, and now I'm in that camp. Like, just do it the way we used to, man. That, let's just go back, back in my day. Like, I find myself saying that. My day is not that long. My day has not existed very long, but I'm finding myself saying it to my 12-year-old son or uh, somebody else. Like, hey, well, back in my day, we did this. And it's a little bit of an arrogance, a little bit of a pride, a little bit of a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm superior thinking uh, but again, we're not talking about he that. We're talking about a bedrock. This is the way it's done because God said it. We're not talking about something that's, okay, is this, a, uh, this kind of a peripheral issue where give or take, you know, we can whatever, and this is a personal autonomy moment. No, no, no. This is what God said, and we're not wiggling from that. 
And I think as a church, as we build and as we move forward always, there is a sense of, hey, let's talk things out. Where do you want to go? What's the needs here in Roanoke? Where can we, where can we you know, lean here to really be able to meet needs? But then there's so much, and it will always be. You know what? No, we're, that's a non-talking issue because this is what God says. We're not moving to the left or the right from that. How someone becomes a Christian. What does it mean to be a disciple? You know, those things we don't move from. We're not saying, hey, uh, this, this will work better with the times. This will be a little bit more free-flowing. They'll understand it better. No, 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 no. Let, let's just go back to the foundation. What do we see done in Scripture? That's what we're going to do. Amen. Period. And I, I, it challenges my heart as I get older not to look back at those ancient paths and look at the younger generation and have my nose up saying, hey, look to the ancient paths. We need to go back there and look at it in a judgmental way, but actually help people see the beauty of it to see the promises that are there in it and guide people lovingly back to the way it was done. Right. And then there are plenty, plenty of opportunities for us to look into other things that, aren't, that don't have much gravitas in, in, in our life to say, okay, yeah, we can do that differently. We can sing some different songs. We can do this and that. And, and we've, we've, we've been flexible. Uh, and we can be more flexible. I'm not saying I, we got it all figured out. But are you with me on that? And I, I think for you to look into your family, to look into your own heart, are you going back? Are you recalling from the way it's meant to be done? Or are we letting progressive thinking in the sense that, you know, what, what does it mean to me? What do I want to do? What makes it easier for my goals, my dreams, my passions? And are we kind of deviating from, God forbid, the word of God? On how someone becomes a Christian, on how, what marriage is, on, on all these different issues that are in our world, we need to go back to the Bible. And you will be called, you will be called closed minded. You will be called archaic. You will be called, you know what, you're, the Bible. Can you trust it? Those things are coming our way. And I have no doubt in my mind that when they look to the ancient paths, when when the men got together and said, okay, let, let, let's recall, we're building the temple. How are we going to map this out? That there wasn't somebody in the group that says, hey, why don't we just build it with that stuff over there? It's right there. Why go all the way to Tyre and Sidon? Why do we got to go? Why do we got to wait for the rafts to come through the Mediterranean? Why can't we do it with something else, man? Like, and it's good hearted. Like, dude, we're building the temple. Let's speed this up. Like, God's presence, come on. I have the same desire as you. God with us. Let's go. No, 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 no. We're waiting three months for the rafts. What? Why? I'm sure. I'm sure there was some issue with the path forward. But we've got to be able to say, well, here's why. Not just it's the way it's been done. But no, here's why we're doing it. Because it's right here. First Kings. How did God prescribe to build the Bible? Or build, build the temple? How did he do that? Okay. That's what we're doing. How long is that going to take? However long it needs to. That's what we're doing. And I challenge us, and I challenge myself, and I challenge us as a church collectively. Do we still seek the ancient paths to guide how we build our lives? Do we still go back to the word of God to seek our answers? And it is... Uh, the voices come in and says, oh, this is archaic. This is the long way. This seems a little bit uh, slow. This seems a little bit, oh, man, I'm going back. You know? And you ask the questions, can I trust this? Was this written by man? Is this some monk somewhere in France that, that spun this around? And you have these questions, and then you go to this new source, and you go to this new source. You see someone else that, that loves God and is kind of building this way, and you're like, oh, well, it seems to be working out for them. And we take shortcuts, don't we? But do we stay and wrestle with the ancient paths until we figure out how to build? Jeremiah 6, 16 says nothing more than that. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. Crossroads. We use that all the time, right? I'm at a crossroads. Bone Thugs and Harmony sang about that. 
Crossroads, crossroads, cross. Such a good song. You're at the crossroads, and God tells us, ask. Ask for the ancient paths. God, where do we go? Show me, show us where to find the ancient paths. Where do we move forward as a church? How do we build? What do you want us to do in this situation? How do we wrestle with these topics, important topics of justice and gender and equality? How do we wrestle with this? Yes, we can learn from our brothers and sisters in the past. But we also need to look to the ancient paths and build accordingly. Is that who we are? If we are, we will build on solid foundation. We will be able to say and sing with a clear conscience, we are standing on the promises. But the moment we start taking shortcuts is the moment we're building on shifting sand. And I know none of us wants to do that. You know, the the reality here, as this temple was being built, commentators say that the stones they used for, uh, oh, cool, thanks, X. The stones they used, you can see a little bit different differentiation. The temple of Zerubbabel, or Shetiel, there's a debate as to actually who built this thing. You can see the Zubarel temple is just a smidge smaller. Can you see it? It's like, oh, man, it's a little smaller than Maybe the edifice in the front, like, oh, we don't have these two pillars. We don't have these two pillars in the front with the lamp, the the golden bowls. Like, oh, man, where's the golden bowls? Oh, (laughs) the little trim on the outside. Like, oh, man, I want to put a nose on the front of my house. We just have a a flat door, you know, God forbid, just a door. But anyway, (laughs) put a little, uh, little, you know, yeah, a little doghouse in the front of my house. But nonetheless, when they were building this temple, the stones they used were just smaller than the stones they used for Solomon. So same material, same place, just a little smaller. And people complained in Jewish history. They complained that the stones weren't big enough. And it's like, okay, really? We go in there? And we, don't have, we can joke about all those who have church buildings because we don't have one. But that's a real deal these days, isn't it? Like, oh, the church building, the kitchen's up, big enough, and you waste so much time, and you forget, why do we have this church? Why are we building this temple again? Is it still a temple? Yes. Is it a church? Yes. Does it have ugly red carpet? Yes. But why do we have ugly red carpet? Sure, we could change it, but why do we have carpet? Because we want to usher in people to God. Somehow. Anyway, so yes, they complained about this small differences of the temple. They remembered Solomon's temple. They remembered how it shined. They remembered the golden bowls. The other thing that's probably of, of, big, of big consequence here is that the Ark of the Covenant was not back with them. And personally, if you want my take on it, uh, that's where I believe most of the weeping came from, is that the Ark of the Covenant had not yet been returned. And that's a big deal. right? They had the altar, but the Ark of the Covenant not there. And I think they're looking at this temple like, okay, it's a little smaller, but it's incomplete. It's incomplete. So I give them a break here. And if you side more with the old family heads, uh, I give you a break too. Because there are some things that we can learn and go back to. That right now you look at the landscape of Christianity, maybe even here, locally in the RVC, and you can look back at things of, uh, and say, yeah, yeah, we did that better. We did that better 10 years ago. We did that better 15 years ago. We did that better when we first planted the church in 04. That was better. And it's not to dismiss that, but it's not to look at the future and say, these young guys messing this up. No, it's let's go back to the ancient paths. Does that make sense? But the overarching thing here that we, I believe, we need to learn is that as this temple was building, they recognized here in verse, verse 11, That despite the smaller stones, despite the Ark of the Covenant not being built, everyone, everyone sang a tune. Everyone worshipped. Everyone with thanksgiving and praise, verse 11, sang to the Lord, He is good. His love endures forever. And what I take from this and what I want to put before us is no, no matter the disappointment or the excitement in our lives, we must come back to one thing. He is good, and his love endures forever. 
This is to a group. This is a group with mixed feelings. And I know that we can come to worship this morning and have mixed feelings about it. Heavy things on our hearts. Things that we're looking at and say, okay, I know there's some promises fulfilled that I've experienced, but there are other promises that have, been not, that have not been fulfilled. And I come to God and I can sing, your love endures forever. But the next minute, I can be weeping. I can be weeping because of the disappointment and the harsh hardness that life can bring. And there's no judgment No elder, no chief priest, nobody's going around wagging their finger about those who are weeping. Saying, why are you weeping? We got ourselves a temple, old man. Don't you remember? No one's saying any of that. It's God's inviting where you are. God's saying, yep, makes sense that this, this isn't all that you had hoped. And I know, so I I invite you to come into this and say, okay, no matter how I'm feeling, can I get to the point where I can sing that song with sincerity? He is good. His love endures forever. Isn't that where we should be wrestling? Not are the stones big enough or where's the golden bowls, but can I wrestle and say, okay, I see all of this. I'm making sense of this. We have a temple. We're building it. God's promises are being fulfilled right before our eyes, he's bringing us back to Jerusalem. Check, but then here I am still with disappointment. But I can still say, he is good. His love endures forever. So where have you experienced God's goodness in your life? Recount those times. Reflect on those times. Where have you seen evidence of God's faithfulness? They had seen it time and time again. And there still can be disappointment even as you reflect on God's faithfulness. But where I believe this is leading all of us to bring it to a conclusion here is that they saw the temple being built before their very eyes and it wasn't enough. And I believe for you and I, that is pointing to a true reality that God wanted them to know then and there. That this temple is never supposed to be enough for you. This smaller temple, whatever your complaints are, that's not what it's about. It's not about this temple. And they didn't really get it because look at the next temple they built. Herod's temple was massive. You could put both of the temples prior inside of this temple. They went big. And what does that tell you about us? Don't judge them. What does it tell you about us? When it's my turn, I'm... (laughs) I'm going to blow this out. And I think, still, what does Jesus say? We're, we're right here. Matthew 24, write this down. I love this. This speaks right to my stinking core. Matthew 24, 1 through 2. As Jesus was leaving Herod's temple, his disciples came to him and pointed out the beautiful architecture of the temple. And Jesus turned to them and said, take a look at all these things. For I'm telling you, there will not be one stone left upon another. It will all be leveled. And they're like, what? (laughs) Our temple leveled? And in 70 AD, it will be. Just 40 years from when Jesus said this, all leveled. And they're still wailing outside of that wall for that temple to be rebuilt, a physical temple. And we're no better. Because we look and we see and we want to experience and we have God's fulfillment, we have promises that we've seen fulfilled, and we have other longings that have not, and yet we still wrestle with, I've experienced God's goodness, but I've also still wrestling with the not yet. And there's no judgment there, but a calling. A calling back to, he is good, and his love endures forever. And then as we know, this temple, this stone, This stones built on top of each other was never meant to be what we looked at with amazing and said, look at this. But what we were supposed to be looking at is not a building, but the very temple himself. The very cornerstone in Jesus. The very Jesus that was in front of those disciples in the flesh. The reality is, they should have been looking at Jesus and said, whoa, it's Jesus. Look at 
him. But they were looking at a building. And Jesus always reminds every single one of us all the time to look and wait and to hope and long for the right things. And you and I are called back as a church to recognize that we are not meant to be fulfilled with anything here. We can look at God's promises being fulfilled left and right. That can give us great encouragement. But if you're disappointed, it also is a call back to what do I hope for? What am I longing for? On Christ's solid rock I stand. Those are the moments of disappointment that we're reminded. What am I standing on? What promises am I standing on? What do I long for the most? What do I look forward to the most? Jesus was that very temple. He says in John 2, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. That very phrase got him killed. The heat turned up exponentially when he said that. Exponentially. They say, it took us 40 years to build this temple, and you say you can raise it in three days. We know. We have hindsight. What was he talking about? Himself. And God knew all the way back here, this weeping of unfulfilled desires was the very path that all of us were going to have to walk. And prayerfully, we would be able to see, not the here and now, and say, okay, this is where my hopes are. The church is doing great. My relationships in the church are wonderful. I got married. I'm dating. I'm healthy. I'm wealthy. Yay! No, 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 no. Jesus. Jesus died for me, and he rose again. He said it would be torn down, and he came back in three days. That's where my hope is. That's where we build. That's where we look in times of disappointment, and that's what we remember in times of joy. Jesus died and rose for me on Christ, the solid rock I stand, what are we standing on today? And if you haven't been standing on it, then jump in line because we're all being reminded of where to stand all the time. All the time. So join the party. But be reminded here. Learn from our ancestors to say, okay, there's weeping, there's joy, there's fulfillment, there's disappointment, there's Star Wars and Star Trek, there's old heads and new heads. But nonetheless, what we need to look at is Jesus was that temple, he died, he rose again, that's what we look for. That's what we long to be a part of. That's where God's spirit dwells. And Jesus himself, and he gave it to us. So practically, practices this week, capture your joys and sing that tune. He is good, his love endures forever. And capture your disappointments from the car cutting you off, from burning your finger on the toaster, to whatever, to whatever great or really heart-wrenching disappointment. And even in, those mo- even in those moments, say, he is good. His love endures forever. And to fight to sing that song. Fight to sing, because we, who know Jesus and know the end of this story, can look at him and say, that's where I get my hope. That's where I get my disappointment, and that's where we are going. We stand on Christ, that solid foundation. Amen. Let's stand, sing a final song. Man, let's all stand. I know that my Redeemer lives and there is grace for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know. Redeemer lives, I know.
Also, if you have children, now is the time to go get them. Yeah. <laughs>